Tonight's meeting, November 15, 2021, to order at uh, 535. First item on the agenda is the select board minutes uh, from the November 1st meeting. I have a motion. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes of November 1st. I'll second that. Any discussion? Yes, just one minor yeah. thing. I think that um, Curtis should be recognized as a member of the select board, not just put in the Zoom category. Yeah, I picked up on that as well. Either, either. That was going to be my comment as well. <laughs> so either way, up here, or just to add him down here and say he's on uh, Zoom or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. on Zoom. Mm -hmm. That's all. And I don't think we need to correct it. Just do it that way next time. Is that look good with you, Curtis? Yep, that's totally fine. Okay. Okay, is everyone in favor then? Okay. Curtis? Yeah. Nope, that was it. Okay, so are you in favor? Yes, yeah, I'm in favor, sorry. Okay. Thank you. So, can I just get clarification? Yes. Do we not have a note paper? Or is, is Martha going to do it via? I think Martha's going to do it because we don't have a. Oh, okay. I, I, do you want to take them? No. Oh, will you take them? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Is there any one? Is there any advantage to do that? Yes, it's a lot easier to take them in person. Okay. Talking from years of experience. Oh, yeah. I can't. No, no. I'm, I'm working on one from a meeting last I'm working on a meeting from last week at work. And it's so arduous. So can we go ahead? <clears throat> or, all right, we'll wait. No, we have to go for it. Yeah? It was a 535 start time. Okay. Um, all right, next item is the orders, um, so paying the bills. Do I have a motion to approve the orders or warrants through today, November 15th? Uh, I'll make a motion to accept the warrants. Okay. Any discussion? Curtis, do you have anything to say about the warrants? Nope, they look good to me. Okay. Uh, so I think the consensus is... I don't think I did either. Okay. All right. I do have, I do have one, one question. In the taxes. No, no, that, excuse me, that's in the, that's in the, uh, it's not in the, so I'm done. That's the way it is. Okay, motion carries. No. And um, next thing is adjustments to the agenda. I would like to make one to um, discuss Damon Hall. David Hall's status, whether it's on the National Register or not. So I think we can put that in um, maybe before your notes. Okay. Any public comments? Any, anybody have anything? Is anybody online, Lauren? Let me check for you. Um, there's some participants, but nobody is raising their hand. Okay. And how many people do we have online? Three. Um, yeah. Three. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Mary, could we get could we get whoever's representing aging in Heartland to identify themselves for the minutes? How do you know somebody's? Um, so one of the participants oh, oh. has like 
an acronym, and then the, their last name is AJ and Carlin, but it doesn't necessarily, that doesn't tell us who's actually oh. under that account. Okay. Um, they can provide it in the text chat, that'd be ideal, um, if they're listening, but... Can you unmute them? Um, I could allow it to talk, but they're, they're still muted. Oh. Um, um, I'm sorry, this is, this is Sarah Bruce in disguise, um, and um, if I knew how to change my name on this, I would, but the Aging in Heartland logo, this is Sarah Bruce, not so, representing Aging in Heartland at this meeting. Oh, okay. Thanks, Sarah. I was just going to ask you that. Okay. Sorry. sorry. That's fine. Thanks for identifying yourself. So uh, we are now going to next order business is old business. So the first item is the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA funding. Okay. I'm speechless on this one. Okay, so I think what we need to do is um, we decided at the last meeting that we're going to hold a meeting in January and then a subsequent meeting. So. Um, we can either hold one or two meetings, but I'd like to get them both done in January, either one or both, if we're going to have two. Um, and I've got my calendar. I want to make these, and because then we have to get that Sarah Wright lined up to see when she can come. So, any um, suggestions, Phil, in January? Um, sorry, I was distracted. Um, um, Mary, I thought last time we were talking about meeting with Sarah, is that what you're talking about now? Well, There's a subset of us to plan a meeting, or, or were you talking about scheduling? Uh, well, I was just going by what we had in the minutes, and I so thought it was just two public meetings. But we're going to have a meeting prior to the general meeting to just uh, try to get organized. Okay, so if it's going to be the select board and Sarah Wright. I agree. Um, I think we can do that in December. Um, that shouldn't be too uh, time consuming. Yeah, so I think we were beginning to recognize the challenge of how to meet as a community. You know, physically, how would we do right. that? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I thought we were going to kind of caucus with Sarah, a subset of us would start to do that plan. So let's do it at a, at a select board meeting. Do we have enough time on the agenda in so December? Just know that the December 6th meeting, we got the budget. Yeah. We'll probably need to do a special meeting after that in between the 6th and whatever the second one is. Okay. So you're going to have a second meeting like the 17th or something to that effect. Mary, I really don't mind following Phil's suggestion of having a subset meet with her to nail things down. Uh -huh. So when you... You're both talking about a subset. Do you, you don't want the whole select board meeting or select board? Is that what you're, you're saying? I really don't. I just want to have a meeting before we have the general public. Okay. She's actually suggested two. She suggested two. That's why it's written here. Public, public input session first, followed by a second meeting with more information about the time frame and expense consideration. So I think, just to clarify, and this goes a little bit to what Curtis was thinking, so I think what Sarah was saying is that you're going to have a big meeting, or you were planning on having a big meeting with the public. That would flesh out some ideas and stuff like that. Uh, there would certainly need to be a second meeting, and I think maybe this is where Curtis, where some of these people would bubble up and, and want to be more a part of this. You might not have the full meeting, but whatever, whatever comes up at the first meeting, there was certainly going to need to be a second meeting, perhaps with her uh, as well, or just maybe on your own, but um, there would certainly need to be some subsequent meetings, particularly a, a first one and a second one. Okay, well... It should be that we can get through this planning process for the big public meeting in an hour at a select board meeting. 
I, I don't. I don't. She's she's gone through this. Yep. You know, so. And would that be with Sarah? Yeah. Sarah. Yeah. 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 We'll ask Sarah to the select board member mm -hmm. meeting. She'll walk us through that. We'll put aside an hour. If maybe it won't even take that long. But tonight, mm -hmm. I'd like to set two dates in January. Okay. So um, I don't think. A Saturday is a great idea simply because a lot of us do our errands on Saturday mornings. Um, but you know, if you think a lot more people will come on the weekend, fine. So it, this kind of came up last time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not really open for business okay. here, um, so it may need to be certainly may need to be remote. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, we push the limits on the public hearing. That we had um, with the amount of people in here, I think that was probably, Tough. you know, in hindsight, I thought it would be a small number of people, but uh, ended right. up being quite a bit. Just to put it out there, Norwich itself is closed its doors to the you know public at this point. With the numbers increasing and stuff like that, I think that would probably be. So we'll have we'll do it remotely. Okay, both of those those big meetings in January. So, um, I would prefer an evening, an evening meeting. So Mary, are you saying you do not want any meetings before January? No, no, I'm saying we can ask Sarah to come to a select board meeting, and then we'll discuss how to run a public meeting mm -hmm. in January. I think I heard from Martha neither of these public meetings until after Christmas because of the holidays. Okay. So, if you two and Curtis feel otherwise, I'm okay with that too. Uh, I don't think we need to rush. Um, I think our plates are going to be pretty full with the budget yeah. and, and just getting through yeah. uh, the next few weeks, uh, next few meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, if you think we can have a preliminary meeting at a select board meeting, I would sort of suggest we do that. And out of that meeting, we can select the dates and, and more talk about more about the format. So if we're shooting for January, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I just think that is a target. But I, I don't know if we're really ready to pick up calendars and say how about. Well, because we can, we can then ask Sarah, Sarah, these are our, our dates. I'd like to lock her in soon because she's got a lot of towns. You know. Go for it then. Right? Okay. Do either of you have a? a um, I, I I have a I have a small. Go ahead, Curtis. These town meetings, if we're all going to attend them, then they're going to have to be warned meetings because we will have a quorum of the select board. So I wonder if it makes more sense for uh, a couple select board representatives to attend. I also don't want it just to become like a select board meeting, right? I want it to be people in town talking about their ideas, what they think, what's motivating them, what's driving them. And I'm worried that if all five of us go to it, that it's just going to be like a select board meeting. Well, Curtis, since we're going to be in charge making these decisions, I, I feel personally in, that it's imperative that we go to these meetings because we need to hear personally what people are thinking about. And then, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think we'll be running the meeting necessarily. Maybe, I, I don't know, who's, we, that's yet to be determined, but... Uh, this is a big deal, and uh, I think we need to be involved. I, I mean, I agree with you that that we need to be involved. We need to be learning what the people are thinking and and saying. But I don't know that actually the best way to learn what everyone is thinking is by us attending, because that might color the conversation. That might impact what people decide to talk about. I, I, I don't know. I didn't see that at the public hearing, certainly. 
I don't think anybody felt intimidated by whatever they thought we thought. So, um, I, well, I'm not I, saying I, intimidated. <laughs> so, Curtis, let me let me just clarify one thing. It's it's possible for you guys to have an open meeting of the public and have select board members happen to attend. If it's not, it's kind of a quirky thing with the statute. Like, if five select board members happen to show up at a planning commission meeting, it doesn't need to be worn as a select board meeting. It's kind of kind of weird, but uh, so if you're having a warned or an advertised public input session, right? That's being run by Two Rivers and is just, you know, a Two Rivers ARPA right. informational session. Five select board members could happen to just attend. Okay. okay. And it doesn't okay. need to be worn as a select board meeting and it doesn't need to be run as a select right. board meeting. But if you happen to attend and sit in the peanut gallery, then so be it. All right. So that clarifies one of my concerns, which is that we would have to warn it as a select board meeting. The other concern is something that I think we can talk about with um, Sarah and like as a group when we're planning for this meeting is just about us trying to sort of be present and listening, but a taking a backseat in the conversation. But that's something we can save for a, a future date. Okay, um, so I'm going to keep circling back to um, nights that we would, evenings that we would like to hold these meetings. Day of the week, preference. First of all, is Martin Luther King Day a, um, a holiday here? It is, yes. Okay, so then we'll probably we'll... be or probably be the seventeenth. It is the seventeenth. So we'll be meeting then on the eighteenth for our second. So you're gonna have a meeting on the third and the seventeenth. Third and the eighteenth. Third and the eighteenth, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So we could have <coughs> the public hearings or not public, these meetings on those off weeks. So like the 13th and the 27th, or the 12th and the 26th, something like that. So we're not, we don't have two meetings in a week. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so Phil, 13th, Thursday night or Wednesday night? Uh, either one is available. Curtis, do you have a preference for night of the week? No? Okay. Um, Gordon, do you? No, oh, Monday or so. I don't know. I don't, I don't care, really. Um, well, we could do the 10th and the 24th, so that would be four weeks in a row of meetings. Boom, boom, boom. Except well, that's Tuesday. What do you mean? Oh, oh, zoom, the, the zoom, zoom, zoom. Oh, okay, okay. What do you think? We could the, also yeah. offer all four of them. To Sarah, we could what? So we could have, we could also offer all of the off weeks in January to Sarah, so that we have some flexibility in case her schedule is otherwise constrained. Okay. Yeah. So the twelfth or the thirteenth is good. Yeah, I am. I'm going to get with my calendar. Sarah, please vote. Okay. Uh, Dave, when do planning commission meets on a Wednesday and the energy committee? I can't remember which day. Is it Tuesdays or Wednesdays for both of them? Planning Commission would meet on the 5th. It's a Wednesday. Energy on the 11th and the Conservation Commission on the 12th. So then Thursdays would be open for those well, people. Well, either that Thursday would be open for the committee commission members and then or the following 19th or 20th. Oh, they just meet once a week, a month. Correct. Okay. All right. So then we're talking about so the tenth or the twenty fourth Mondays. Those or we could do 
the 13th, 19th, 20th. Is that what we're looking at? Those would be only a week apart. Anybody have an opinion about those two public meetings being a week apart? Oh, you're talking about both meetings? Yes. All right, how about the 13th, 27th? Those are Thursdays. Let's just make it simple. We'll try either those Mondays, the 10th and the 24th, and then uh, Thursdays, uh, 13th and 27th. Okay. And those would be the ten and twenty-four. Yeah, here. The tenth, the thirteenth, the fourteenth, and the twenty-seventh. I didn't write down the fourteenth. What's the fourteenth? No, that's a Friday. So ten and twenty-four. Those are Mondays. Thirteen and twenty-seven to Thursdays. Sure. Dave, do you want to ask Sarah? Or you want me to call her? I'll reach out. I left a message with her today. I'll reach out. Right, great. I just told her that we were discussing this tonight. And it had been two weeks and I spoke with her, so I just said that this was being discussed tonight. I have further info for her. Okay, so we don't have to take a, an action on that, do we? That's just discussion. Is that, that's not an action item, is it? Uh, you kind of took action. Um, do you want a motion? In, um, I think that the, I think if, if there's consensus that we'll look at meeting in December, um, possibly December 20th if that's open, or the week before, um, and then we're looking at two dates in January, mm -hmm. either on a Monday, 10th and the 24th, or a Thursday, the 13th and the 27th, or any kind of mm -hmm. mixed match of such, as long as it's apart from each other. Mm -hmm. I think that if everybody's okay with that, then I can give her a shout. Okay. And you were talking about the, a budget meeting. Uh, definitely going to have one on the 6th, okay. and they generally run two meetings. The second one's not quite as long as the first. On the 20th. Um, so just know that you, uh, outside of Sarah, you're going to have, you know, for December, the most important things you're going to have is the budget discussions and Sarah in there at one of those meetings. Okay, so are you, Will you ask her which one she can come to, or do you know which one would be best for her to come to? Um, Earlier the better, uh, if we are projecting a date of January 10th. Okay. Can you do it? You're okay with that on the, te on the uh, 6th then? If it's the 6th, just know that the 6th is going to be a long meeting, that's all. Well, I'll be rested after all that Thanksgiving turkey. That's right. We'll be sleepy. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thanks, everyone. Um, and now, Dave, it's your turn. The second order of old business is fiscal year 22 budget update. I'm going to delegate that to Martin, and Martin, okay, can, Martin. Can, Martin can speak on where we're at budget wise. Good evening. We'll start with revenues. Um, as you can see, uh, we're at 88%. Well, let me start at the beginning. This is for the month of October, the fourth month of the fiscal year, mm -hmm. which is 33%. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at 88% uh, on the revenue. Obviously, we're up and over because we've collected the tax, or not collected the tax money, but we've filled the taxes back in August. Um, 
Vermont hold harmless, we should see that money in November or December, depending on the state's doing it this year. It's either month or the other. So that obviously will come in. Uh, pilot payment. Uh, the state paid us a little bit more today. So that will have another $3,800 in it for next month. Um, you can see on the second page, uh, the accountant error I made for the $99,000 is gone. It's in the proper year. Nimrick fixed it. It was something pokey pokey. Yes. I key punched something and they were able to fix it. So I took care of that the next morning. Um, as you can see, the wreck is chugging right along. They're only at uh, 20%. Um, the after school. I looked at the after school uh, revenues versus expenses. The revenues are just ahead of the expenses, so oh. we're going to be okay. Oh. I believe revenue will be fine. Okay. And then on the highway department, as you can see, we have we still have two more quarterly payments from the state of Vermont to come in, but we book it ahead of time and create a receivable. So where are we? That's not here. The highway department revenue. Yeah, but I don't has its own page. Unless it's at the end of the regular revenues. Did you see it? Okay, well, never mind. Keep going. Okay. Any questions on the revenues? Uh, Mom, just the um, five thousand oh, dollars grant that the library got for the rural, whatever the title. Yes. Is. Does that have any contingencies as far as spending in this fiscal year or calendar year that you're aware of? No, not that I'm aware of. That, that yeah. it's kind of an odd grant that most libraries get it and they can use the money for pretty much anything. Yeah. There's really no limitations on what they they can use that money on. Yeah, I know they're working on deciding how to use it. So yeah, she's, she's been spending some of it, and she has another grant. It's an ARPA grant, but it's a library ARPA grant that's due in this week for, I believe, $5,034. Sure. She got me the, um, the specs on that uh, last week, so I've been reading through that grant. So I do have a question. So the highway grants and aid projects budgeted for $15,000. When does that come in? Um, that was slowly coming over the fiscal year. Just dribs and drabs? Yeah, and, um, exactly. Martin, my, my question was about the taxes, current taxes. Is that the first payment? What you expect on the first payment? No, that's the whole, the whole ball of wax. So, but I take out, so the million dollars, but I've taken out the school portion of it. <laughs> so we, we build out over $10 million worth of tax bills. Uh, Six, six million, because we got a million here, so about a little over six million dollars. I've taken the school portion out and put that in a receivable account. So as we pay the school, the receivable will go down. So this is what the town's side of the tax bill looks like. And for the year? For the year, correct. And that's this payment that we made plus the one in January? Nope. So I two back. Correct. Okay. Well, that straight yeah. Mine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any more questions on revenues? We'll move on to expenses. Again, as I said, we're at 33% on page one. Uh, as you can see, we are within budget. On page two, the assessments is over budget at this point. That will catch up as the year goes on. On July 1st and August 1st, I have dues and payments that are due as the fiscal year starts. So that's why this account um, always is kind of catching up as the, as the year goes on. All right. As we um, go through each page, you'll see everything's pretty well in line except page 4, the North Heartland School. We put a fence around the basketball court. We're going to figure that out at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, the rec department is within budget, year-to-date, a touch under. 
Uh, capital improvements, uh, you will see the uh, three corner project has a $8,500 expense, but on the revenue side, I believe there's a $12,000 revenue against it. So yes, it's over budget, but we do have a revenue against it for a grant that came in. Buildings and grounds is over budget. TJP are more. It will not be billing us now probably till April. I believe we're done for the winter, so that will catch up over the next two months. And by the end of the fiscal year, again, that will be right on track. Uh, appropriations. I've paid most of the appropriations after the first tax bill run. So obviously that is over budget at this point, but that will catch up when we get to the close to the end. And after our second payment in February, I will pay the fire department and the rescue squad the second half of their payment. The library is... is Within budget, um, again, there's, they're going to be a, a different read this year because of the grants they have and the expenses. A couple of the grants came in the last fiscal year. The expenses are going to be in this fiscal year. So the expenses this year will probably be higher than, than their budget only because the grants came in last year and they couldn't spend the money in the month of June quick enough to finish the fiscal year. So if we take out what we've prepaid, we're actually at 30% for the general fund. So we're, we're under budget at this time. It's tight, but we're, we're able to, to stay under budget at this time. That's good news. Yes, it's great news. <laughs> Especially four months into it. There you go. Any questions on expenses? Curtis, do you have any questions? No. Looking good. Thank you, Curtis. Phil? Oh, no. Right. Yeah, he, he nodded. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, the highway department, as you can see, um, is, is under budget for the summer. Uh, they're slightly over on um, summer maintenance. That will catch up over the next couple months because the hard pack will, will slowly reduce using. We'll start using the winter, the winter side of uh, the, twin, uh, the highway fund. Um, starting this week is the winter labor. We go November 5th through uh, April 5th. So the, we will start using the winter uh, expenses. Uh, we didn't do the paving this fall, so that's why it's, we're slightly ahead at this point. So as you can see, the highway department's at 20% year to date. So I made a note for the budget for a new tree in four corners. <laughs> <laughs> Just so we remember to put that in there, Dave. So we've actually been a little, a little off track here, but we've actually been offered a tree, which I think is going to go on the front of the rec center. Oh. Um, to be to be continued. Okay. I'll keep you up to date on that. Okay. But that doesn't fix the four corners tree. Just New. <laughs> any questions on No, I want it has nothing to do with money. Is there any way you could make a, a heading in each section? It's printed bigger? I don't believe so. I believe it's a can system. And that's very rigid, that software mm -hmm. seems to be. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Bill? Yeah. 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 Uh, during Dave's report, I, I wanted to ask about the dilemma with moving the sand and mixing hard pack with the sand, but it's really not a budget item, so I'll, I'll leave it. Okay. Curtis? He said he didn't have any questions. Okay. Right. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, Mary, I just want to add one thing to the budget. It's kind of a town manager update budget type thing. So. The highway budget will be affected by the Mill Street Bridge. Mm. Uh, we do have, I think it's twenty-five dollars to thirty thousand dollars that we've received in grant money. Uh, I don't know entirely what that's going to be that can be used for, other than the work itself for the bridge, and um, we'll see how much work that needs in the next couple of weeks. To date, we've probably got maybe eight to nine thousand dollars we spent over $5,000 for a gate that uh, we needed to put in with uh, at Twin State, kind of where Twin State and, and the greater upper valley. 
um, solid waste district composting facility is. It's, it's right beyond where the Old Town Highway is. That was part of the agreement with Twin State, uh, or part of the agreement that we're working on with Twin State was to put that in. We also needed to put some, some boulders down up by the Greater Upper Valley Cellar Waste District Field to kind of keep people on track. That was maybe $2,200 to do that. So that's close to six, seven, eight. So we're about $8,500 and we haven't even you know, opened the bridge yet, but just, so that will pop up on this, on the, the bridge section. We don't, we really use the bridge section of the budget, but those are going to start popping up on the bridge and all the signs that we had just under the sign expense item. I think we're going to pull over to the bridge as well. So it's all kind of captured in one area. So just keep an eye on that as we progress. That's all. I think so. Over the years, you're going to get to use that road again. <laughs> so, will those boulders and the gates stay in place after the bridge is fixed? Or? They will. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, next item. Uh, old business. Item three is delinquent tax sale. Yeah. So, this is something that uh, Phil actually brought up at the last meeting, but it was um, a kind of casual conversation. So we do need someone to represent the town to bid on any properties. If a property is not bid on by anybody else, um, instead of that just reverting back to the property owner and, and the leverage of the tax sale is kind of lost. Uh, the town generally bids on the property um, and then We'll do something with it, but uh, we need a representative. We need to name a representative um, for that. That is a week from today. I can't remember the time, but it's uh, Monday the 22nd, and uh, I think we had a volunteer, but we need to formalize that in the minutes. And, and So I'll make that motion that we appoint Phil Hobby as the town's representative at the uh, property tax sale on November 22nd, 2021. I'll second that. Well, you know the, the time, let me know. I have the date saved. I don't want the time. 11. 11 o'clock. Any discussion? Uh, not on that, but just where are we at with. Six properties, seven properties? It was five in his notes. Is it still five? Uh, it is five, I believe. I believe we, <coughs> I believe, yes. And so do you think there's any chance that it'll be fewer? There's one on that list that has a history of coming in the day of okay. the tax sale. Okay. So that remains to be seen. The other ones are crickets, so we'll, we'll see. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we're all in favor, I'm guessing, of this. We're consensus on this motion. Curtis is nodding, yes. All right, so now we're going on to new business, which is always exciting, something new. Errors and omissions, and the listers are here to talk about those. Right? I'm guessing. Three of you are here? Yes. <laughs> So, um, you guys should have gotten the packet the letter we presented to you. It basically states, to the Heartland Select Board, um, citing the state statute um, 32 DSA subsection 4261, correcting omissions from the grand list, which states when real or personal estate is omitted from the grand list by mistake or an obvious error is found, the listers, with the approval of the select board before December 31st, may supply such omissions or correct such errors and make a certificate therein of the fact. Provided, however, the listers make, may make a correction resulting from the filing or rescission of a homestead declaration without the approval of the select board. And so, as such, the Heartland Board of Listers is requesting the select board's approval to correct the following errors and omissions and amend the 2021 grand list. Starting with parcel ID 009047000, 
Span number ending in 10637. Owner of Sarah White, property located at 98 Densmore Hill Road. The um, gross living area of the Section 3 dwelling on this property was incorrectly listed as 1,852 square feet. The actual square footage is 1,128 square feet, corrected. Um, resulting in a change of the total assessed value on the property from $507,900 to $480,100, a difference of um, less $27,800. Second error is parcel ID 00307100, span ending 10375. The owners are Kinney Edward Jr. and Jean Ann. It's located at 159 Brownsville Road. One acre was subdivided in error with the acreage listed in the grand list as 7.30 acres. The corrected total acreage should, is 8.30 acres with that acre back in. Um, and uh, Edwin C. the Kinney the third should also be listed on that property as an owner per the deed. The total assessed value changed from $209,100 to $211,900, resulting in a difference of uh, plus $2,800. Parcel ID 00317100. Span ending 11769. The owner as um, Edwin Jr. and Jeannie Ann Kinney and Edwin C. the third Kinney. Located at 150, or 163 Brownsville Road. This parcel was created in error with a subdivision. It's an invalid parcel as such and should be made active, inactive, sorry. The total assessed value on this vacant parcel was $41,400. It'll now be zero. The difference, of course, being the $41,400. Parcel ID 03012100, span 10012. Comcast Corporation. Um, this is personal property equipment. There's no actual location. Uh, the incorrect exemption code was applied. It is um, been changed to a voted exemption, which is what it is, where personal property is exempt from municipal tax. The total assessed value on this par property or parcel is $1,662,444, and that remains unchanged with this. Then on parcel 02300801, span ending 11745, the owner is MAHHC LLC. It's located at 40 US Route 4. This is the solar array, just to clarify, and not the actual property that the solar array sits on. There was no value listed in the grand list for this particular parcel. It had become active and gone online in 2019 and hadn't been entered in. So it is taxable now that it is active and online. The value has been calculated and entered into the grand list. The total assessed value was $0. Now it's $641,100 for a difference of <coughs> $61,000. $641,100. And that's what we're requesting to be able to um, have you guys approve the corrections and changes on. Any questions about? Yes, I have mm -hmm. a couple. Sure. Uh, on the one. Yes. Uh, you've uh, taken a, an acre away. So it's a little bit of a... So you take it from one place, why, why isn't it showing in another? Because, so let me just break down as briefly as I can what happened with this. This was a parcel that's a contiguous parcel merged from two different purchases made in like 2016 and 2017. An acre they bought in 2016. 
Then they bought 7.3 acres in 2017. Two separate deeds. They never had one deed made for the parcel. Then they turned around and had a deed come through later in 2017 or 2018, putting the son's name on the, parse, on the property, but it only listed and cited the 7.3 acre deed, didn't cite the one acre, but they had the 8.3 total acres. His name was not actually put on the grand list on that at that time. So they made a correction this past year of adding his name onto that one acre parcel that hadn't happened before in a corrective deed, but it didn't say corrective deed. So when we got it, it looked like they were pulling one acre out of the parcel and putting their name and their son's name on it, which is not an uncommon thing to occur. So we subdivided it because that's what it appeared to be at first. When the Kinneys came in, they questioned that when they were paying the tax bill, when they got two separate tax bills this fall. That's when it became, we became aware of it, dug down deeper, looked at it, realized what had occurred. It shouldn't have been separated. It should have stayed as one. It, you know, so that's what happened. So now we're just putting it back as, you know, that one acre back to the original parcel. So to avoid this in the future, do you did they have one deed made with both of those? No. No. And a lot of people don't when they buy abutting properties. Um, and, and, you know, it's because of the contiguous statute in the state of Vermont where if you have property in the same ownership, you know, even though there might be separate deeds, we have to merge them for tax purposes. So if enough time goes by, that isn't necessarily clear on the surface. So it's upon us to just be a little, dig a little deeper down in a few years to kind of make sure when we're seeing things that appear to be subdivisions come through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, my, my second question felt the yep. solar, solar panels, uh, solar array. Yep. Um, so when, when is this uh, tax going to apply for next year? No, that applies this year. For this year? Yes. Even though That's the gone first the bill has already been paid. They've been sent an amended bill already, a revised bill. Okay. They were sent a bill of zero dollars. <laughs> so um, that, that has been corrected. But it, it should have applied last year also? It should have. Okay. And it got missed. Both by us and at the level of the state, too. Okay. Things happen. Yep. Any other questions? No, so this Perhaps. is going to be, we're going to get more taxes than we anticipated, right? Um, no, on two of them, it's a little bit less. Right. But the solar array, yes, we're going to get taxes so that we didn't know were coming in. Yes. The net of this list should be an not, increase. Mm, not really, because of the way the Comcast Corporation was done. Oh. They were calculated a municipal tax where they shouldn't have been. Uh, municipal uh, tax is exempt, so it's. Uh, yeah, yeah. Boo. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so we need to take an action on this, I believe, um, to accept um, probably your list of. Um, yeah, there should be, um, I think Dave has it, we, there's a form that's actually filled out with all these errors and missions that we use to amend the grand list. Do you have a copy of it? Oh, I never even turned this over. That's okay. What we all need to do as a board of listers and a board of select, board, the select board, if you approve mm -hmm. the um, errors and omissions, is we all need to sign that and then submit it to the town clerk to amend the grand list. This one has no, the ones in your packet have like a B1 or something at the top. This one is sort of original. a clean copy. Okay, so just, just anybody, hey, hey Curtis, you want to make a motion to accept the, the errors and omissions certificate? So moved. Is that comprehensive enough, that motion, what I just said?
Do you need any more detail on that? So I don't think so. When we have the date. Okay. For November 15th? Yeah, that's what's on the document. 2021, okay. And uh, second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Curtis? No. Okay. All right. Then so the motion passes, then we will sign it. Lister signature. Thanks, Stacy and Cheyenne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I would say eleven fifteen. Curtis, can you come in tomorrow and sign this? Yeah, I'll, I'll be there in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. Our revenue is looking up. I'll bring it over. <laughs> you want this now or tomorrow? You can sign it now if you'd like, and then it's done. Okay, we are done with that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now, second uh, item under new business is the Katie Brook Trail which is a regional conservation district project and uh, there's a road permission form that we need to discuss and take action on. Are you here to do that? No. Oh, you're not. I'm just here to be supportive. That was pretty definitive. Okay. <laughs> All right. He's I got his pom pom, so okay. I move this on. All right. So I think Dave, maybe this is for you. Uh, it is um, the Caney Brook Trail. So Sue Greenall is with the Regional Conservation District. Uh, you may Sue was also involved a little bit in the um, relocation of the legal trail on the Renee. Um, can't remember her last name. Johansson. Johan yep, Johansson pro uh, property. She has been active with Katie Brook Trail before. She has um, solicited grants that has helped to shore up the, the, the roadway um, in the area of the Beaver Dam, uh, where it was kind of degrading. Uh, she's shored that up. She took on, this came in front of the select board a couple of years ago, um, kind of when I first came on, after she finished that Beaver Pond project where she shored up the road, uh, there's actually three stone culverts beyond the beaver dam towards the town forest, a little bit beyond. Two of which have failed to a good degree and create runoff and, and problems on the trail itself. Um, kind of a continuous problem and she's been trying to solicit funds to essentially solve that problem and to keep the trail in decent shape year round. Uh, she did solicit and, and obtain grant money to do the design work uh, for essentially box culverts in the form of basically a bridge uh, that are upsized and make for um, a good size opening um, with basically a bridge with the trail going over this area um, in question. 
There's two of them for both culverts. Uh, she did solicit the money, as I said, for the, for the design work of this. Um, the United States Fish and Wildlife uh, has weighed in. Uh, I'll just pay, pass this around. Uh, they have written a letter in support of this project and what the design does for uh, the, the runoff situation there. Essentially, you have water that kind of comes down from the town forest area as you're coming in from Jennyville Road going towards, say, Morley Road, I think it is, on the Katie Brook Trail. The water comes down from the left um, in, in small streams, essentially comes across, washes out the trail area, but makes its way to a stream which is on the right-hand side as you're on Katie Brook Trail. She, due to COVID and some other funding issues, ran into a problem uh, with the implementation part of this project, um, which was about a year and a half ago. She thought she had shored up some money in the springtime. Um, that has yet to be approved. Um, she is putting in for this grant, uh, which if they fund it completely, and it's possible that they don't fund it completely, in which case you would get yet a secondary grant or another grant matching to this. Uh, if she gets fully funded, it should cover the full cost of the implementation of this project. She has put together a, a basically a maintenance agreement with the Vermont Horse Association, um, the Green, I'm sorry, the Green Mountain Horse Association. Uh, GMHA is going to maintain these bridges. Uh, so the maintenance part of this is um, going to be picked up by GMHA. The grant is actually to the Regional Conservation District, it's not to the town of Heartland. Uh, so Sue has taken this on, um, I believe probably in the spirit of the horse folks, but um, to a benefit to Heartland and to anybody else that uses Katie Brook uh, Trail. Um, so this is I've been kind of watching from afar her kind of struggle with this. I think she certainly deserves uh, an award for hanging in there and sticking with it and, and her perseverance to see this along. Uh, and she's hoping that she can finish this off and, and um, solve the problems. It's kind of an annual thing. I think at this point it's, it's completely beyond repair, but uh, in years past, there's been people that have gone back and tried to piece together the stone culvert um, it hasn't, um, they haven't been able to solve that issue. Uh, at this point, it's, it creates greater degradation than it does, um, you know, more than it helps anything. So certainly these structures uh, will be a benefit to the trail um, and those that are using it. Um, and um, what, we, what Sue needs from us is essentially permission to work within the right-of-way. Um, this is a for a class four town highway form. It's actually a legal trail, but to be safe, we I brought it to the board to um, for you guys to support the sign. Uh, I had crossed out the class four and written in a legal trail just to let these people know, hey, look, it's actually not a class four, it's a legal trail. So I have a question, Dave. Yes. Um, this Julie Butler from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, she addresses this letter to the Miles Scutney Regional Commission, which does not cover Heartland. So I'm just wondering why she did that instead of Two Rivers. Uh, I think that Sue may be out of... Um, so this grant is not coming to Heartland. It's going to Sue Greenall, who works out of West Windsor. Oh... So this is not, so this is uh, us essentially supporting, uh, us supporting, um, you know, her efforts in getting, in getting a grant, that, which will in turn help the Katie Brook Trail, which will in turn help those that use it. Yeah. Which is primarily the, the mountain, the, the, the horse boats. Yeah, I'm, I'm not all so for it. Just so it. they this can was, see how it kind of yeah, goes around. Yeah, but Gordon has a good point. Can you just point that out for me? Uh, yeah, it's pretty blatant. 
I didn't see it. Yeah, it says Hartford. Probably must have been Well, hopefully. <laughs> There's not another Katie Brook trail. No, no, quickly no. realized that there is no Katie yeah. Brook trail in Hartford. Well, I did do a search today, and there is a, there are, there's another Katie Brook up north, but nowhere near. Did you? Did you make a search? That's what so Dave, in, in your heart, says town commits to maintenance. So that's Ooh. really going to be GMHA? Yes. So there's an actual. Um, Agreement between GMHA and um, um, the Regional Conservation District. So these new culverts are going to be strong enough to support a um, pickup truck or something more than a horse, is what I'm asking. Uh, it's not feasible. They're not really weight limited for a vehicle, but um, they're certainly going to be more than sturdy enough. Um, this is Kind of what it is going to look like. It's not going to be quite this big, and the metal railings are actually going to be wood, so it's going to be all wood decking. Mm -hmm. so, I was just thinking about people with uh, four wheel drives that are looking for places to go. Are they going to? Oh, yeah. Wow, they're not. Oh, we don't have that policy. We don't have a policy that they can't go on Lego trails, right? Well, we do not. We can put a gate up. I mean, that would be bad. A policy with no vehicles would be a good thing in my mind. But um, wow. we did uh, we did agree to a motion to consider visiting a uh, class four highways and legal trails policy for the town of Hartman. Yep. So I don't know what became of the discussion, but I think that there's been, uh, this topic has been lurking in the Conservation Commission um, listing of maybe things to do for a while. So um, I don't know what the outcome of the last meeting was, but we may see something arise from them on that particular issue. Yeah, we, we can't restrict uh, possible roads, can we? If it's a legal trail. I know. I've seen language, I think we'd have to check on it, but I've seen language where the recommendation is to restrict vehicles on a class four road. I'm just thinking, I mean, we, you, you were with us when we hiked that trail up in Jennyville, yep. right way up into the, to the town of Woodstock. And the only, the obvious problem with the trail was the four wheel drive vehicles. It was quite a steep hill, and they had put they made a lot of water marks, but the four-wheel drive rings went down through, and the ground was soft, and went right through the water bars, and, and so the water could just run right down. And We've kind of said that we're not interested in paying attention to it, but the state of Vermont would like us to, if there is a rut of a foot or more uh, in that stormwater runoff, statute uh, essentially that tells us to ditch, uh, there's language that we would address something with a foot or more um, from a runoff perspective so that you get, you know, you get a rut of a foot or more and, and you get a heavy rain, it's just going to kind of flow down. So if you did not have those vehicles, then, you know, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. The only... The only issue I might see, whether it is a class four or if it's a legal trail, and we've kind of addressed this um, in the past uh, with the Britain property, is that, um, you know, loggers do kind of depend on a class four road sometimes or a legal trail to get lumber in and out. Um, you know, we have you know, taking money, you know, in exchange for making sure that they leave the road as they should. Um, we kind of have started that. Might not be a bad thing to incorporate into that. Mm -hmm. There are some mixed uses that you need, you need to consider, but, um, you know. Rob Ander. So the Conservation Commission has been talking about a policy for legal trails and class four roads. There's a, a model that the Vermont League of Cities and Towns has 
that we can start from. But um, what I would hope will come out of that is that there will be certain trails that we will recommend no motorized vehicles except snowmobiles in the winter. Um, but we could have, we put. I'm sorry, what? Could could we? This is mostly to Mary, Mary plus Dave. Could we put um, a presentation of this model policy from possibly Rob slash Conservation Commission on an upcoming meeting? I mean, not in the crunch time, but. Yeah, I think if we allow us, Curtis, to get through the crunch time, I think that might allow the Conservation Commission to kind of chew on this a little bit and, and, and do a little bit of legwork for us. Uh, and then yeah. um, they might be able to come with something that's a little bit more refined. But I, I think that, in my mind anyways, if the Conservation Commission were to continue kind of on the path, I think I hear Rob saying that they're going to embark on, then... I would expect that to then come in front of the select board uh, at some point in the near future, not too unlike the Sunrise Falls management plan that they put together. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, we're trying to figure out at the moment is we'd like to get some public input on a policy like this. And uh, so the ways, there are a couple of ways that we could try and do that. One is, uh, the listserv, which is sort of selective, but it does reach people. The other would be to have some kind of a public meeting that we would warn and, uh, you know, take whoever showed up and just uh, collect information that way. And we've not yet talked about what the best way to approach that is. Um, so that's kind of where we are at this point. Now, we could do that after we come to the select board as um, you know, we could put together something based on the UVLT um, or VLT. City, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, based on their model policy, we could come up with something, bring that to you, and then go get public input after that. But um, I think- Well, at least there's one stage of public input into the policy process, Rob, because if we approve a policy, we have to warn it in the newspapers and there has to be a public hearing for it. So what I'm hearing, Curtis, then is you would think we should just come with a policy and then you know, as part of the select board approval process, it would get that public input. Well, I, would, I would be totally fine. I mean... Anything, any, like Dave said, any legwork you could put in ahead of time to make the process as simple as possible once it reaches the select board will be to the benefit of everyone. So if you as the Conservation Commission wanted to take initiative to have a meeting about that to talk about which legal trails and class four roads maybe should not have automobiles on them or something like that, then I think the select board would see that as a wonderful service. Or I would. I, I can't see my colleagues' uh, facial reactions, but I would. We're all frowning, Curtis. <laughs> oh, no. No, I'm kidding. I, I agree with Curtis. Yes, so yes. We, it makes more sense for you to go ahead, your group, and come up with something to start with. And then we can bang it around afterwards, or the public can, or whatever. Okay. I think that makes a good way to go. Yeah, I just remember this. We, we walked on um, a class four slash legal trail. I don't remember. It was the back of beyond, and it was so yes. degraded. Degraded. That was that Blood Hill Trail. Oh, my God. It and it was impassable. Awful. It was awful. And we have other trails like that. But it, I'm saying because it had had vehicles on it. Yeah. And they just... Oh, this, that's different. Right you know, that's, yeah, that, that's the one I'm talking about. And, and there's, no, there's no entity that took responsibility for repairing the damage that they caused. You know, it's not like the Horse Association or VAST or whatever. They all, and loggers, I, I'm guessing from what you said, they take responsibility. Okay, we caused damage, we want, we'll bring it back. I mean, they, it was, 
the, the banks of the road, they were like above our heads, and it was down a ledge. It was. Yeah, well, the, um, it was. It was one terrible. of the issues here, I think, not well before I was on the commission, the commission did recommend to the select board that motorized vehicles not be allowed on Katie Brook Trail. Mm. And that's when the gates were put up and people just went in with pickup trucks and yanked the gates out. And yeah. so now the gate on the southern end is always open. And so people go in and out on the southern end. The northern end is closed. There's a gate there that's, that's closed. And so people come up through there from the south. But um, yeah, if we make policy of no motorized vehicles, we have to enforce that. And that's, that's going to take some doing. Is there, is there any reason why a motorized vehicle, or like a truck, needs to get through that trail no. ever? Well, there are cases when they're trying to maintain the trail where they have to put in gravel or something like that. And so um, the Horse Association uh, at times has used motorized vehicles on it. Yeah. But that the select board can give people permission to do that, even if there's a, a policy that says no motorized vehicles. I guess what I'm thinking is some kind of an emergency. Yeah. Uh, someone falls off a horse and has right. to be rescued by uh, the town's uh, ambulance. Are yeah. they going to be able to go over this bridge? That, that's kind of my question. But I think the question about the bridge here is a good one, because if having, you know, if they're going to put all this money into building bridges and culverts and then motorized vehicles are going to tear them up, that would be a problem. So, um, so just to sort of get us back to the, the permission request form that we have here, maybe Rob, you could email Dave and try to find a good time that fits in with the select board schedule because we're busy in December and then January will be the ARPA meetings. So maybe in February or around that time, if that would work with Dave and Mary, then and the Conservation Commission's schedule to have sort of a draft policy that we could start discussing um, towards the end of the beginning of the year, that would be really cool. Yeah, we can do that. And you only meet once a month? We meet once a month. And do you have a subcommittee like that meets more often to, to meet, to work on specific projects or? On certain projects we do. Um, not on this particular one. Well, I was just thinking, you've already got the Sumner's Falls thing right. that you're trying to wrap up. and Yeah, and, and that should be ready to wrap up very soon. Uh, uh, so I think by our December meeting, we could easily spend some time talking about legal trails and class four roads. OK, well, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, is everybody we can entertain a motion? I'd be happy to. I make a motion to accept the project project resolution of commitment from municipality form as presented by the Adequichi Natural Resource Conservation Service for the replacement of multiple trail system crossings on the Katie Brook Trail. I have not correct Parker to Hartland. Well, and it used to be called the Adequichi Natural Resources Conservation District, because I used to work for them. So, I don't know, this Ripple group is not paying attention. Yeah, I know. Okay, so, do um, you want to second that? No, I'll second Any discussion? Yes. Okay. I just want to know if anybody has actually looked at these stone culverts. Did you look at them, Dave? Uh, it's been two years since I've been out there. But uh, two years ago, the one was in particular bad shape. And um, my understanding is is that the, the other one is, there's remnants of it, but the, the water's going in, and, and it ends up kind of bubbling underneath the, the stones. It kind of comes down and it's creating. Yeah. Um, that, that's the one where you, they see where they talk about removing the sediment uh, yes. prior yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's creating problems. Uh, I did speak to Sue today. She did say that um, 
you know, there was, you know, the engineers were, you know, you know how they get all excited about new, improved concrete. You know, they felt as though the third one needed to be maybe replaced, but they've been able to salvage and, and the third one that's closest to the Beaver Dam, I understand, is working effectively. Um, and that one's going to stay, but these two were um, not, not in good shape. Yeah, there's one of these that um, in the spring, it makes the trail essentially unusable because it's there's a stretch of 10 or 12 feet where the water is just running right over the trail and you can't, you can't walk through it without waders. Mm -hmm. Curtis. Um, the only thing I wanted to say was it's really awesome to have such an engaged citizen who's motivated to persist through all of these issues that are arising. And so at some point in time, as this project nears its completion, um, as a select board, we might consider um, extending our thanks to Sue. You're shaking your head. Yeah, you know, I. Mary. He's a proponent of the horses, but it's it just works out really well. Sure. I think that sure. uh, you know we don't we haven't directed the resources to Katie Brook, and they've picked up the slack. So I think it's right. just a I think we should be I didn't see this appreciative person, of it. Person's name on any of the paperwork. <laughs> what did you want to say, Curtis? I said at some point in time we should express yeah. our appreciation yes i we heard that and then you said mary so i didn't know if you had a, something additional no phil was poking fun at me saying that you were shaking your head he was taking advantage of the fact that i can't see you all at all times and my social anxiety uh, okay. okay well we i think we have a consensus and we will sign this and we will thank Rob for coming in and explaining things. Bill, well, it's it's Sue Greenall. She's she's worked quite a bit with Wynn, so if you ask Wynn about her, um, she they put in a similar really nice bridge over by um, the Windsor Town Forest area. There's a trail, there's like a mile field. I can't remember the exact trail number, uh, trail name, and it's kind of Easy mountain biking out there. The, the trail, the, the bridge that you go over to get to that field right. is one that looks just like. She's looking on a quick cheese. Yep. She she is. She is. She is. Uh, There's like a, it's a one man band. One she, person. She, she one person in the Blood Hill thing. Yep. Yeah. Kind of in the background. Yeah. Lots of um, lots of things to sign today. <laughs> yeah, you're missing out, Curtis. adjustment item to the agenda, which was the putting, making sure where Damon Hall is on the National Register of Historic Places. So um, this pops up in my head uh, every now and then. Um, when I, I, a few years ago, I came across a bunch of research that um, someone had done 
to put the building on the National Register. And uh, so I asked Les Watchman, who's on the his, uh, Heartland Historic Book Committee, Society, whatever it is, um, and he knew about it, so he found some information. So it was the town, or somebody paid a guy back in 1986. His name is Hugh Henry. He was a historic preservation consultant from Chester to do some extensive research on Damon Hall. And this was part of the National Register nomination information. I don't know if, if it went any further. Do you have any idea? No. The thing that does come to mind is that when we celebrated the 100 year anniversary, we did do, pick up quite a lot of stuff. You remember? Maybe that's when I saw all that information. I don't know, but this is so. Um, I can remember that, yeah. Phil, so, or Les came up with all of this stuff. It's very interesting about the building. I don't think it popped up on the registry when they did the historical review uh, for the intersection project, but I could, oh. be wrong. I could be wrong, but I don't think it popped up. So I tried to look on the Nationalist Registry. I, I didn't have enough time, but it, it didn't come up right away. I mean, it's, it's kind of a labyrinth to, to navigate that search engine. So anyway, um, this is something I'm interested in pursuing because I think this building should be on the National Register. And, um, and this is from VLCT, their newsletter. So Brookfield has theirs on the their Town Hall National Register. Fairly does. Um, Paulette does. And this is just, you know, six towns out of six towns that are mentioned here. So um, I think David Hall deserves to be on that and I'd like to pursue it. N nothing to do with you. Not going to add to your plate. Unless. It always, it's always, something, always something to ask. <laughs> There'll be a phone call somewhere that comes in that. Well, is, there, is there a downside from a renovation or construction perspective? I don't know. I don't know if they, I don't know what the requirements are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when we worked on the hall before, put in the changes that occurred out there. We did. We got into that anyways. Historic preservation, doing it right. Mm -hmm. Oh really? Yeah. Was this yeah. The Steve Crooker? Uh, no. Oh. Well, well, that's the time. But um, what is his name for Woodstock? I should know. He was a side judge, most recently. Oh. oh Mr. Honey. I know who you're talking about. I can't think of his name. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, I think that comes up anyway. So the right, way so I understand, the way I understand the National Historical <laughs> Registry is that it's oftentimes used as a tool for people who want to take away flexibility from the owners of the building because it puts lots of restrictions on exactly how. Um, renovations and changes to a building can be done. So it's a way of protecting the character of the building, yes, um, but it does impose a lot of additional restrictions. Like Dave was saying, when they were doing the review for the Three Corners intersection, if Damon Hall would have been on the registry, Given that Damon Hall was so close to the construction, there might have been extra costs needed to ensure that Damon Hall was maintained or, or whatever throughout the construction process. So I think in general, it's a good thing. It's nice to see old buildings persist, um, but I'm just wondering if it might take away flexibility given that we want to preserve the building anyway, why would we sacrifice the flexibility? That would be my question. Spoken of as an anthropologist. 
<laughs> I believe in living culture. <laughs> I, I'm a little aware of that. I was involved with the Orozco. Uh, for instance, there was a water penetration in the basement of Baker, and we had proposed a solution to fix the water. Uh, and all of a sudden, we had a pause because we had to have an inspector come out from the National Registry to expect that what we were doing was not going to change altering. Meanwhile, the bloody prints were getting wet. Yeah. And that was not the prints, but the fresco. Uh, so there are uh, some benefits and there are some potential mm -hmm. ideas. But go find out. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and number six, manager's notes. Uh, yeah, to, quickly, uh, I also spoke to Les today, he had a question on the, the water testing. Um, oh, yeah. It's not come back yet, um, so we'll put along, I'll work with uh, Coda and Coda to make sure that we get that, so. Um, <laughs> Three Corners Intersection Project, speaking of which, it is still in front of VTRANS for the issuance of an 1111 permit. Uh, so it's still being reviewed. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Martin has submitted uh, our bond application to the Vermont Bond Bank um, to put the financing in place. They have two offerings for bonds, once in the winter time and one in the summertime. Obviously, the winter one would be what we're looking at so that we're ready to go in the summer. Uh, you may recall we went through this process last year and we had to pull the application because it became apparent in about January, early January, that we weren't going to be able to get out the bid. Um, so they're familiar with us. They're familiar with Martin and the project. We've spoken with them, but that has been resubmitted at this point. Highway Ben Mill Street Bridge is at this point becoming uh, is, is coming into focus. What we're waiting on at this point is to finalize an agreement with Twin State Sand and Gravel. Uh, it has been put together. When I put your update together, I had not yet received it from Twin State. I have did receive it late last week. Uh, it has gone to our legal counsel. It has gone to VLCT. I didn't get any real detrimental comments back from either entity. Uh, so we got a couple minor comments to make to them. Uh, we'll send that back to Twin State and um, looking at signing that hopefully by the end of the week. Uh, and to get that going, if that falls, pieces fall into place, we will um, be looking at getting in there and um, pulling the, the rotten pieces um, kind of apart, doing an assessment the week of November 29th, which is the week after Thanksgiving there. Um, and I will be sending out uh, a letter, James, to the nine residents on that side of the bridge, um, most likely tomorrow or Wednesday, kind of giving them a heads up. It's been difficult to communicate with them because there's just been an unknown as to you know how this is going to happen and, and the timing of this particularly working with twin state but it looks as though the pieces are starting to fall together at this point i uh, don't know what that is going to mean for a closure or how long the detour will be in place but uh, hopefully if it's uh, if it can be done quickly that would be great for everybody involved um, the work will address the decking that uh, is showing rot uh, we will need to, at some point, do an assessment of the overall bridge uh, and greater maintenance will need to be done to the bridge at some point um, in the future. Um, but at the moment, it's to address the immediate triage, the immediate um, issues that uh, are, have created the closure, and we'll go from there. Phil, yes, winter sand has been an issue, um, kind of self-inflicted. Uh, however, we are moving it at this point. Uh, we do mix the, um, the manufactured stone sand in with it. Uh, we put a little bit of salt in with it as well, uh, just so that it kind of moves through the trucks when it gets down to zero. Doesn't completely fix it, but makes it easier. Uh, 
you know, we can have that all done by Thanksgiving. That would be pleasant. So cutting it a little bit close this year. Um, staffing had a bit to do with that as well as D and D's equipment. But uh, we did start moving it late last week, and after I put this together, and um, lightly today we had some rain issues that we took care of. But uh, that that is moving at this point. Hey, on the subject of the highways, um, I think we're all a little disappointed about the uh, paving, and hopefully next summer is better. Certainly with the it may not be or maybe. Um, but I'm wondering, um, there was some major cold or hot patch put down on the Heartland Coochie Road, and there's still some pretty, in mean, the areas that were going to be paved, they're still pretty rough. Uh, um, is there possibly anything we can do to, in that temporary paving, to sort of improve that before winter really comes in? Uh, from a from anything more than the hot pads that was put down, uh, we're not going to get anything more than that. Okay. Um, just to get them, you know, at this point they're shutting down things. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they generally, the plants actually close, start to close come Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, and even when it's, you know, we've got a couple nights and then, you know, below 30 at this point. Um, you know, if it gets into the 50s during the day, it's, it's paveable, but it's kind of sketchy. So I don't see any even temporary paving on the horizon until we can address the paving that we were going to do come spring. I don't know what the future, hopefully, you know, um, the employment situation seems to be getting better. So, you know, maybe some of these positions that, you know, the rain was part of this, but also the lack of workers didn't help anybody this summer. Mm -hmm. So if, hopefully if these construction companies have that in place come next spring, uh, it's not quite as rocky as it was this summer, then you know maybe it's a smoother process for us mm -hmm. come next summer. Okay. And if we theoretically increase our budget in March um, or approve an increase in the budget in this area, we would just identify either more of the Quichu Road or more of another Bowers or whatever. Uh, actually, we got Clay Hill Road on our horizon next. Um, yeah. You know, it's the, um, you know, we would like to be able to turn around and do that. You know, right after you know the, the calendar, mm -hmm. you know, turns to July first. Um, we may have to end up. I don't want to say that because of the bridge, but um, you know, two years ago. We had them come, we were in the same position, they came in May uh, and did Brownsville Road, and we ended up doing, we said, heck, we got the budget coming in July, we'll just spend it now and, you know, let it catch, you know, we won't do any of the next fiscal year and kind of let that catch up. Maybe we'll do the same thing. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's something that we're going to need to get on Pike and, and, and Blacktop's horizon in the near future if we want to make that happen. Thank you. Tax sale we talked about coming up next Monday. Uh, I believe we are down to five. Um, town report. Uh, Michelle is on it. Mary, I'm surprised she didn't lasso you last time you were in. Well, uh, I'm waiting I think for it's my. Coming. Yes, it was to do today. I'm <laughs> waiting for my fellow select board members. I, I solicited um, suggestions, but I haven't heard anything from any of them. <laughs> so it could be that I'll just have to write it myself, and they'll just have to. I'm just taking notes, Mary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Curtis, you must have something you want to uh, put in the uh, the select board letter or report in the town report. I can't imagine thinking anything important that you wouldn't already think of, Mary. <laughs> wow, way to get out of it. Okay, Curtis. Curtis, it's up to you. Or, yeah. or we could ask Martha to do it since she's not here. Mm -hmm. I was going to. Well, I, I I mean, I've kind of forgotten about it. Yes, yeah, I was thinking about sending in another, another reminder to everybody. But. I mean, 
We've always been late. We're fully engaged. Uh, all I'm going to say is Michelle is, a, Michelle is the sweetest person, but if you drag her down, uh -oh. Uh -oh. she will. Okay. You will okay. hear from her. Try her. To say. Okay. Try her She's yeah. on a mission. Okay. Get report done. I'm not putting any notes in there. No, no. <laughs> So, if there is federal or state spending, uh, there generally is a historic review of some sort. So it's not um, you're not totally unprotected. So, on the ADA Access Project, uh, we did need to submit uh, some information to Agency of Commerce and Community Development to see if a historic review is going to be necessary. We're fully expecting that that's going to be the case. Uh, in which case, whoever is working on that project, whether it's an architect or an engineer, is going to need um, a specialty in, in historic uh, building and, and design. So uh, there is a layer of protection there um, if the funding comes from the state or federal government. John Leonard uh, has been toying with an RFP for the Foster Meadows walking path. We talked about that. Um, a while back with the funding, we put some money away for him uh, to do that. Uh, that's been delegated to him, so he's put that together. We'll see if we can um, you know, get that out come uh, late December or January. Uh, would, would be nice. Hey, um, should that come to pass, uh, uh, the, I believe just based on my last meeting with Rise, that there's still some monies left that maybe we could piggyback on what the Conservation Commission is doing of getting the model signs and maybe add, adding some signage with Rise Vermont grant monies, which is all about getting people out and getting people healthy. So, uh, uh, John is also on that so he should be aware of it. Just you might just remind him and ask him to go knock on some doors there. Okay. So, yeah. hey, do you do you have any idea what John has in mind for that path? Just to essentially scrape, you know, kind of the, the top surface there. Uh, you know, down. You know, I, I don't think we've determined the depth was to say two, three inches, uh, and then putting down some stone and hard pack stone. type material. Yeah, the only the only thing that's different from when it was built is the grass. I mean, the sod has developed on top of the hard pack. Yeah, we're. I don't know if it's could be done. I was, just, I was wondering if you could just use an herbicide, just Roundup or something. No, no, no Roundup. What no are, what Roundup. are you a proponent of Roundup? I can't carcinogen. Turn it down, Ralph. <laughs> There's nothing good about. It. Stirring up something that's already done. Would filter fabric do it? I mean, you could, you could smother it, maybe. Yeah, could just smother it. From, from oh, the, I don't know about filter. You mean like put it on top? Part. Well, just wait for it to die. If you're, you know, we're, we're beginning to solve the, the, the RFP here, but, um, you know, just. Um, You'd have to dig down to get, so between the hard pack and the soil is where you need the, right. the fabric. Yeah, I don't think that would uh, stop the weeds. Anyway. Well, it wouldn't stop it. You know, I just I can show you my patio, which is probably coming on 10 years old, and, and <coughs> the filter fabric hasn't stopped it for about eight years. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that's a, um, that's usually used where you've got a, a soft underneath, mm -hmm. and you don't want it to come up through the gravel, or the mud to come up through, so you put that in. I don't think that applies right, so I think, Gordon, what you're touching on is that proverbial if we get it done correctly once, is there going to be a some sort of budget to maintain it going forward? Yeah, you know, I don't even know how you do that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's pretty hard to stop grass from growing. You know, it's coming in. Um, I don't know what the answer is. You could pay the kids from the after school program, you know, you know maybe sense for uh, the maybe someone has I know they have a machine that goes on, um, Mark Palmer has one that's got some kind of teeth on it that would, would grind down through that hard surface. 
the only one to go down a little bit, stir it up, and, and actually just... Well, they did that back when Joe Jr., Joe Olmstead Jr. was here. They kind of rode up till it, and I'll be honest, it didn't... Didn't do any good. Almost made it worse, actually, just because, you know, we actually ended up having a little bit more grass grow up through there than <laughs> what was there prior. Because it grew out of all the seeds to the surface. Yeah, it was just like mm -hmm. plowing. Grass grows better after plowing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what the answer is. There will need to be some more consistent maintenance done to it than what was there prior, um, just to keep it to where it needs to be. Course, the other question I have is, what's the problem walking on grass? If you knew where the path was, and we just need to deliver no, it. If, 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 if it's an ADA, ADA accessible, uh, uh, you know. Hard enough for a wheelchair. Yeah. Hmm. So we don't need to. Oh well, we can't do. Work on that. We're anymore. like five months away from that slaying that dragon, but um, yeah. he's working on it. Yeah, that's good. Maybe. Yeah, that's good. Maybe he'll figure out something good. <clears throat> uh, so, also, you know, emergency situations arise quite frequently here. So uh, we've kind of known the floors at the activity mm -hmm. center were going to need to be addressed. We actually even budgeted for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had hoped to be focusing on it at this point, but uh, you know, between labor issues and at this point the Mill Street Bridge and a couple other things uh, that had been pushed aside. Uh, however, it is front and back center in front of me as an issue that needs to be rectified sooner rather than later for various important pieces that are important to Mal Rainey uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, may even need to be addressed before or during the Christmas holiday. So um, she has um, uh, taken things. She has reached out to several people that uh, do floors. Um, and I will join that effort um, shortly, but uh, it is um, something that is now going to be, need to be done um, very soon. So just know, you know, I, I don't say this only to, you know, have you guys put things in perspective. You know, sometimes we get lost in the broad things of, you know, ARPA funding and, you know, other bigger political issues, but at the moment, so you, you're going to have, uh, if we continue to go down this path, you're going to have some, some uh, you know, we, we got some projects coming down the pike, uh, potentially the three corners intersection project this summer that continues to go uh, uh, follow the path that it should follow. That is going to be a nice disruption for us. I'm sure that we will hear that as that project goes along. Uh, we are trying to put the ADA uh, of the rec center into place, um, and we've also got the Mill Street Bridge coming down the pike, um, as well as uh, perhaps what John will be working on with the rec center. So it is all good and um, certainly moving in the right direction, but um, I'd like to space some of this out a little bit, but uh, we'll tackle them as they come. So just know that. Um, I, I think that we potentially have a pretty busy um, eight, to, eight to ten months in front of us. Mr. Dave, you told us before what the problem with the floors was. Is it, is it uh, advanced clean enough? Or oh, I, they are just down to bare wood. Oh, so you so can't have, um, yeah. you know, they essentially consider that finish essentially a paint. So you can't have, you know, anything that may chip or, or you know, someone will put their hands on or anything like that. So uh, you do have the, the, the worn wood along with remnants of the, the finish there. So uh, you, if you can joggle your memory, um, Val Rainey did talk to Browns was one of them. Uh, they seem to indicate that perhaps they did that maybe 15 years ago, um, maybe more or less. But um, my concern would be, you know, how many you know, how many more sandings does that floor have left in it? Uh, I don't know how many times it's been done, but, you know, at this point, it, well, it needs to be addressed. I guess you have to talk to the, to the 
core centers to make sure they don't penetrate the wood much. Just get the, get the dirt and the varnish off. <laughs> At this point, it's actually, I don't know if it needs to come down all that much. So, uh, you won't have to buy a new floor. Yeah, boy, that would be a treat. Uh, lastly, just know generally uh, it is best, and I like to present the budget before Thanksgiving. That is not going to happen due to all our activity that we've had the last month. It is going to be pushed back to December 6th. Just means that we get scrunched up in December uh, and early January. So that'll be kind of a busy month there. Um, it'll give me a little bit of breathing room, but um, you know, just know that that puts us um, a good meeting behind uh, at this point. Um, best to have that budget adopted first week uh, or the first meeting in January. So um, just won't have too much time to mull it over and digest it. I hate to even ask this question, sir. Any speculation as to whether or not we actually will physically hold the town meeting this year? I mean, if I was to vote today based on the statistics that have just kind of emerged over the last two weeks, I think I know what I would say. Uh, gosh, let's just wait until... <laughs> yeah. I think Brian hit us up last year in December. We didn't tackle that question until, Much you know, our second... Yeah. week in, in December and then we tackled it in earnest in January. I'm just going to say I'm a little baffled as to who is getting sick at this point, but um, our numbers are more than double than they were last year at this point. Right. You know, we're getting 500, you know, cases. Uh, you know, last year we topped out at like mid 200, so... Uh, you know, I kind of a head shake here. That, that, that probably includes all positives, test positives? Uh, the number has been test positives. The, the yeah. count, the way they've been doing the count has been consistent since I've been yeah. tracking it. But yes, that's positive. Now, better, the better, positive. Number, better number is how many people are actually in the hospital. So that's increased now. That's, that's increased, increased too. yeah. I know, but yeah. it's compared to last year, I'm getting at. I don't even, I don't know. Well, they're getting up there. Yeah. yeah. yeah I don't, I don't know. It's baffling. Oh, no. What? Did we overlook something? Oh, we did. What? Um, we'll get to it in a minute. Oh. I was ready to do the executive session. Yeah. I was trying to be on. I think we can solve that little riddle. But uh, that's all I got. Okay. I, have, I do have a question for you, Dave. So when the twin state agreement um, comes back from the lawyer at BLCT, do we have to sign it or are you signing it? I'm just going to, I have the power to sign it. Um, it is, uh, again, I really don't want to lose any time on this, but long and short of it is, um, a lot of it is already done. We had to put up a berm you know, stone wall, more or less, up by the Greater River Valley fields. We had to put in the gate uh, on uh, Quarry Road. Um, we needed to put markings and signage all along Quarry Road, uh, reflectors. They wanted us to put down line striping, but um, it's just too late in the season and there's nobody available to do it. But we've agreed to, you know, do that if we can, when we can. Project may be over by the time that happens, but mm -hmm. uh, painting the dirt. Uh, Quarry Road is paved road, mm -hmm. so um, a good third of the loop that we need to detour on is actually quite sophisticated, wide private road, for lack of a better term, with a really nice bridge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, also, while we detour, another part of the agreement, while we detour residential traffic, it'll be open 24 7, which is why we had to put that gate in there. If 
the bridge is open, but we still have a detour. Um, anything over 10,000 pounds will detour, but they can only detour Monday through Friday, 7 to 4.30, so there will be restrictions on that. And Twin, Twin State is not going to let us detour infinitely, or what's the word? Infinity and beyond. Uh, Indefinitely. <laughs> um, into indefinitely, yes, thank you. Um, both will carry the, you know, shared certificates of insurance with each other. I think that's about it. Okay. Now, is, is that the thing we overlooked? Or what, what? No. Something so that's it for the uh, town manager's update. Okay. The agreement is coming down the pike. I'm going to put that in motion. Okay, a question on the yep. detour. You said it can't go on indefinitely. Are we going to drop back? When the bridge is all fixed, are we trying to drop back to the way we were, uh, taking um, the possibility of taking a fire truck over the COVID bridge, or we're going to have the option of using that road? So, um, so fire trucks will be able to use that road. Um, that's just a given. There has been allowed use of like Green Mountain power trucks. There has been in the past, uh, there has been use of septic trucks. You know, if you call ahead to Twin State and arrange for a time to go through there, there's someone accepting of that. They do not want a marked detour and a permanent detour that states yeah. Mill Street traffic over 10,000 pounds you use Quarry Road. So it's going to go away. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of the septic company that has done a good job in the past and has, you know, had an arrangement with Twin State, would call every now and then and say, hey, can we get through? Um, that worked. But they're just not going to let a blanket the detour forever go through Quarry Road. You know, what I just thought of is how about future development on that road? I mean, is there, is there, you would probably know this, like, <laughs> parcels that are going to be developed there, and if, how, that could be disastrous, right? If you're adding more homes up there. So, one of our largest land holders in that area is the Solid Waste District. Right, yeah. So, it's not if, a lot of... If we treat them nicely, um, perhaps they will not do anything other than composting in future Yeah, well, they get to use landfills. the bridge anyways. What's that? They get to use the bridge. They get to use right. their own bridge. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, like, let's say w right. look, any of the property owners up there, could they subdivide and sell off a parcel and somebody could build? So here's the problem is that the town has never given it much thought and the townspeople, have, the residents on that side of Mill Street have never paid attention to that 10,000 pound weight limit. So they're now coming back and saying, well, what are you gonna do about this and what are you gonna do about that? Well, you know, the bridge has been there since 1879 or whatever. It's like, you know, things haven't changed much. I think the problem is, is that it's never been widely, you know, voice that you know you should not be driving an oil truck over this and there's even a act 250 permanent business at the end of mill street that's got trucks probably over 10,000 pounds as should probably have a garage somewhere on the other side of the bridge you know it's just has never been addressed in the past so my answer would be no it's not a very smart thing to develop on that side of the bridge. no but there's nothing to stop it correct okay. Somebody wants their kids to have a little house they'll subdivide and, you know. As long as they have a Prius and some solar panels, that works okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as they need oil, yeah. or... Yeah, but they, they, the oil companies can go over there with a small load. They don't have to fill the truck just before they leave. But they do because it makes them more efficient, right? Do it 
There was one company that stopped delivery. Uh, this is where it actually this first reared its head. There was one company that got so inspired and said to their drivers, you know, you shouldn't be going over bridges that are posted below. And that woke some property owners up. However, there was also one oil company that really didn't care um, and went over anyways. So would they be in uh, would they be in Windsor? Uh, perhaps. <laughs> Could I could I request that we uh, move on to the executive session? Why are you getting tired? Yeah, I'm. I'm actually. I'm playing tennis in four hours. Well, I have to wake up for tennis in four hours. Oh. Okay. Well, sounds like you didn't have a good schedule there. needs to resemble something like that. Okay. So. So I make the motion. Oh, okay. I uh, would like to make a motion that we go into executive session. I, I have it in front of me. Mm -hmm. But I think I have to read it. Or do you want to read it? He can make the motion. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'm just reading what Mark wrote in the last minutes. Uh, That's what I was reading. Yeah. Okay, we're going. <laughs> Uh, because uh, executive session is necessary because premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. And I need a second to that. Second. Two seconds. Two seconds. 